Okay, for the last talk of this part of the of the afternoon, uh, I want to thank Nico, the organizer, for having me here. <laughs> I, I don't want to thank myself. <laughs> Today, in this part, I'm going to talk about cross-linking mass spectrometry. That, uh, like proximity labeling, is a technique that is going mainstream in in mass spectrometry, and. It's a low resolution technique in structural biology, but it, it, it serves many purposes. And we are going to talk about a little bit how cross-linking mass spectrometry can help understand the structure of proteins and protein complexes, but also we can use it to make protein-wide analysis. So as I told you, cross-linking mass, uh, cross-linking of proteins is is, uh, well, is well known for many for many decades, but now is using uh, it is being used for mass spectrometry also thanks to the advancement of the sensitivity the sensitivity of the, the, the mass spectrometers so what is cross-linking mass spectrometry i'm going to i'm going to say xlms that is one of the many abbreviations well we we all know how cross-linker works uh, cross-linkers are uh, chemical regions that are uh, very reactive and they possess a functional group that has the ability to react with a functional group in a protein you know and in this case the uh, the cross linker can join two residues together and locks the interaction in place forming a covalent bond between two different proteins or between different uh, peptides or parts of inside uh, within the same protein in this way, the physical interactions are locked in place. So, as Rosario told you, we can use stringent conditions uh, for uh, washing our complexes because now is everything joined together. It can be said that XLMS is uh, is a type of structural biology technique, and in difference uh, other structural biology techniques, it relies on very s uh, small samples. We, we don't need that, that much amount of protein, just the, the few micrograms or, or even nanograms that we need for uh, mass spectrometry. We don't need that the protein are highly pure, uh, that for example compared to, I don't know, magnetic resonance or Krabi IM. And the good thing about, uh, about cross-linking is that we can examine interactions really close to the physiological state of the organism. XLMS has many applications. Um, the most well-known is to uh, study the conformation of protein complexes, but uh, now that uh, XLMS has advanced uh, through the years, we can do more things more things for example we can if uh, if we know the structure of the protein complex or, or our protein we can use the information of cross-linking to refine the structure or if we don't know the structure of our protein we can use the information uh, uh, from the contacts of the cross-linker from one residue to the other to then help other high resolution techniques such as x-ray crystallography to refine the, the structure and to get good uh, 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 structure uh, from, those, from those techniques. But also we can use cross-linking mass spectrometry to understand and study conformational changes in, in protein complexes. For example, if you have a, a protein complex that you uh, lock in place with a cross-linker, if you change the conditions, and the, the, this protein complex change its conformation, now we can understand, thanks to the difference in mass, uh, in the mass spectra, that these conformations exist in one condition and the conformation changes in the other. Because cross-linking mass spectrometry is going to give us a map of the interactions within that protein complex. And finally, this is uh, more recent, we can use quantitative cross-linking mass spectrometry to understand this very same thing like, like this, but in the whole cell, and I'm going to show you a, a, an example later in the presentation. 
So this is the typical workflow of, of an Excel MS experiment. It is quite uh, simple in nature. What you need is a, a suitable cross-linker to use. We are going to talk about this in, in, in a few slides. Then you perform the proper rea the reaction in, in a tube with your samples. Then the, the, the rest of the workflow is the same as we, are we were discussing in, in the morning. You digest your proteins, but now you are going to, we are going to have a different uh, population of, of peptides. We are going to have the unmodified peptides and then the cross-linking peptides that typically they are the minority in the, in the sample. So we are going to see how we can detect this, the, this type of peptide. So one thing is to do an enrichment sometime, some form of enrichment to keep or enrich these cross-linked peptides and then we inject this in the mass spec and then with all the information from the max spectra we use a database search and a special software specialized in cross-linking mass spectrometry. We are going to see that also. So for all of these steps we are going to see how we can make it happen. So, cross-linker selection, how we are going to choose our cross-linker? Because if you put in Google cross-linker regions, you are going to find like hundreds of different cross-linkers. So what is the best or what is the, the preferable one? Depending on what you are going to do, but this is the anatomy of a cross-linker uh, molecule. And you can have very simple cross-linkers and very complex cross-linkers. For example, obviously, uh, the, the, the most important thing is that the cross-linker always has a reactive group. Mm? We, we need to join by these reactive groups the two residues in, in our protein complex. But then cross-linkers ha can have different other things that are going to make easier for us to enrich them or detect it, detect them in the mass spectrometry and we are going to see that in a little while. Regarding reactive groups, we can have three different types of cross-linkers. The most well-known are the NHS ester and derivatives. Those are the cross-linker that target lysines or well, uh, amine groups uh, like the protein terminus and lysines uh, more than anything else. These are very well known, for example, the family of the super-8, DSS and BS3. And well, the difference between DSS and BS3 is that uh, here we, ha we have a sulfonyl group, so this BS3 is more soluble in, in water, so uh, cross-linker solubility is also an issue to take into account. Uh, well, these are really available and they, they are very, they are the chemistry is very well known. So this is the, 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 more s the, the, the most popular uh, cross-linkers in, in, in the literature. DSS, BS3, DCH, and BS2G. But also we can't, uh, lysines is the, the residue that uh, the, uh, is the most popular to target. Also, we can use the dehydrocytes and the aso derivatives targeting carboxylic acids, and that has an advantage that Glutamic acids and aspartic acid residues are more common in proteins than lysine residues. And also you don't have a problem with, tra with trypsin cleavage. Because when you modify a lysine with, your, uh, with a cross-linker, then trypsin does not cut anymore. And so you have larger peptides, and larger peptides are difficult to work with in mass spectrometry. So you can have an acidic cross-link for example, AXL and or DMT, DMTMM that target uh, uh, carboxylic acids. And also you can have fo photoactivatable reactive groups. In these cases, you have a, a cross-linker that can target the lysine on one end, and then they have here an acide group that is very reactive and if you uh, illuminate your sample with UV at 350 nanometers, this group is going to react with almost everything around it. So this type of 
uh, uh, crosslinker are very good to obtain a high quality network of proteins uh, interacting together because they are very, very reactive. Uh, for example, this you have to add to the sample solution, but you can do in vivo experiment with this crosslinker, for example, using for acido l phenyl alanine and this modified and natural amino acid you can incorporate it into your protein by a specific strain that uses a transfer RNA uh, targeting a, co a stop codon but uh, modified to add a for, a for acido phenyl alanine into the uh, protein and then you can illuminate your sample and then start doing cross-linking in vivo with this type of crossing. One thing that we are going to see also is the distance between the reactive uh, uh, functional groups. When you look at crosslinker, you have different distances and they give you different information. For example, if you, use, you are going to use uh, larger spacer arms, you are going to detect uh, interactions that are farther away in within the protein or uh, within different proteins. But it, it is important that we talk about what are, what are we saying when we are talking about distances, you know? Because when we look at the uh, at a catalog from, from a company and we look at, okay, VS3 has a phase around of 11.4 Armstrong. That doesn't mean that you are going to uh, cross-link residues that are within 11.4 Armstrong. Because this is the distance be, uh, between here and here, between this, the, the spacer arm. But when in, structural, in structural biology, when we are talking about, generally about distances between residues, we are talking about the distance in alpha carbons. So when a structural biologist tell you, oh, this is 11 astron away from the other, he's he or she is generally talking about the distance of alpha carbons. But these uh, cross-linkers, uh, are going to react with the epsilon nitrogen of lysine. And lysine is a very movable uh, functional group. It has a lot of rotamers and it can be one in one time like this and then like this. So basically, even though, for example, in this case that this alpha carbon and this alpha carbon is within uh, the, the space where the crosslinker could react in principle, if the rotamers of lysine are uh, facing away from each other, then you are not going to detect that interaction. So, when we're talking about distance in crosslinking, bear in mind that we, we have the spacer arm of the crosslinker, and you have to add the side chain of lysine, that is 6.4 Armstrong. So in theory, the crosslinker can join together alpha carbons here that are 24.2 Armstrongs away from each other. And this is the case for BS3. Obviously, for any other crosslinker, you have to look in the literature what is the distance that can be joined together. And that's not the end of the story. You also have backbone dynamics. The breathing of the protein makes that uh, sometimes residues can come together because of backbone dynamics. So, for also for BS3 in this paper, they show that uh, using a, you can detect two residues 24 uh, Armstrongs away, but they should, but we should add at least three or four Armstrong more because of backbone dynamics. So. For VS3, you are going to detect two lysine residues whose, whose alpha carbons are away, maybe like 30 Armstrongs away. So this is a common mistake for many people who are doing cross-linking. They say, oh, I'm going to detect everything within 11 Armstrongs. No, you are going to detect everything within 30 Armstrongs. So what else? This, this in part in the middle of the crosslinker can help you do a lot of things in mass spectrometry or in enrichment. For example, we can have here what is called uh, MS cleavage here in this part, where the crosslinker has a, a 
a functional moiety in which inside the mass spectrometer this part can be cleavage in the collision chamber you know so for example in DSSO uh, you can join two, sub, uh, two different peptides uh, by the crosslinker and this inside the uh, collision induced dissociation chamber you can have a cleavage here or here so inside the mass spectrometer you are going to have four different populations of pep crosslink peptides that can form be to be because of because of the different cleavage sites inside the mass spectrometer this is very advantageous because for example for the this yellow peptide you are going to have this peptide with this species and this peptide with this species where the, the crosslink was uh, was cut here how is we are going to detect this in the mass spectrometer we are, we are going to see a doublet two signals here with a delta m of this part and for the other peptide the same we are going to see in the detect in the mass spectrometer a delta m of uh, this part so when you are studying an ms2 spectra if you see this doublet you are sure that you are looking at the cross link species and then with the sequence information of the MS2, you can know which peptides were uh, joined together. So, MS cleavage crosslinker are going, uh, are uh, gaining much attention. I highly recommend that if you're going to use uh, crosslinking for your studies, uh, keep in mind DSSO uh, or any other MS uh, cleavable uh, crosslink. Uh, for example, th uh, this is uh, one of the most complex uh, cross-linker there is, of course. The more complex, the, most the, m the more expensive, but at the end, uh, you will have better data. Uh, for example, PRR is a very complex cross uh, species because you have a lot of things. For example, here are the, uh, the reactive groups that are going to react with the lysine residues. It's also a cl MS cleavable crosslink here and here, and also have a, vi a biotin handle, like Rosario told you earlier, where you can enrich the crosslink peptide later. So, talking about enrichment, we move on to, to that step in the protocol. As I told you before, we are going to have two different populations, cross-link peptides and linear peptides that are not modified. And these are the, ma the majority. So you really need to try to enrich the population of, cro of, of cross-link peptides if you want to detect it better. And also, inside the, the population of cross-link peptides, you have sub-populations. Sub for example, you can have, a, if, if these are two different proteins, for example, you can have one peptide from one protein to another, this is the one we, we want to detect, but we also have cross-linked peptides from the, the same protein from, from its own structure. And also we have different types of uh, cross-linked species. For example, this is a dead-end uh, cross-link in which one functional group reacted with the, with, with the residue, but the other part reacted with, I don't know, maybe water or trees in, 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 the, in the buffer. We can also have loop links where a lysine uh, was joined to another lysine in the same peptide. And all of that is present in the sample. So we can have two different types of, uh, of enrichment uh, parts. One is that you can have the reaction uh, between your protein complex and Maybe you are lucky enough to see that your protein complex is locked in place in a, maybe in an electrophoresis. So uh, if you have your protein complex and e after the cross link reaction, you see the dimer trimer or whatever, you can pull it out of the gel and you will have enrichment there. Or you can use any other type of biochemical uh, technique like chromatography to enrich your sample. So, Let's move on to the MSMS uh, or uh, the LCMS MS part of the, of, the, of the workflow. And this uh, is very important to 
keep in mind that we need to use more than one crosslink. Of it is better if you try to use different types of crosslinks. That is better. And to uh, troubleshoot the, the, the concentration. But also when you send the sample to the mass spec, keep in mind about this, uh, also this, the, these options. For example, in the chromatography phase of the LCMSMS, column length is very important. In our experience, using uh, larger, uh, longer columns was better. And also use shallow gradients, mm, maybe two hours or more. And in the MSMS phase of the of, of LCMSMS, these two uh, variables are very important. For example, charge exclusion is very important. What is, what do we talk about about charge exclusion? As Pia told you before, when you uh, when the peptides enter the mass spectrometer, they, they pick up charges like plus two, plus plus three, plus four, plus four. That is very important in proteomics, but. In cross-linking, you can leave out the plus two, for example, because if you're uh, joining a peptide with another, chances are is that you are going to have plus three or plus four because you have the aminus terminus, two of them, and in the other part of the peptide, in the carboxy terminus, you have an arginine or a lysine, and you have two also because you're joining two peptides together. So you have at least four re, uh, amino groups that can pick up a charge. So cross-link peptides generally are not plus two, but they are plus three or plus four. And you can tell to the facility, I don't want to look to plus two, and you, in that case, you eliminate a lot of linear peptides that are not interesting. So then it comes the parts of that analysis. In this case, the best is to use uh, software specialized in cross-linking mass spectrometry. There are several of them. And in this week, tomorrow, starting tomorrow, we are going to use some of them. This is SIMXL, Spectrum Identification Machine. That is a very simple uh, software to use. You only have to put your database and to tell what is the cross-link that you are using. And the software starts to do its magic and tell you uh, which uh, peptides were crosslinked. We are going to see this in the rest of the week. If you're lucky, you are going to have these results where the, this is, these are results from SIMXL where uh, the program shows you exactly not only the fragmentation of the peptide, but also where the crosslink was located. And it shows you in different colors the, the spectra corresponding to the different Y and B ions. So that was a very good quality spectra. What is a poor quality spectra when you are doing uh, cross-linking mass spectrometry? Something like this, for example. In here, the, because all software give you, el, uh, as Pia told you in the morning, they give you a score, they give you probabilities, they give you a lot of options, and then you have to do manually if it's good or not. In this case, the, the software, this is not SimXL, this is MeroX, and another one, another software that we're going to use the, this week. And this is, for example, a, a spectrum that uh, it could represent these species. But, for example, for this peptide, we don't have any Y or V ions. So is not um, uh, unambiguously uh, designated. So this is a bad spectrum. And here, for example, we, know we also have a bad spectrum because for this peptide, we don't have any B ions looking towards the crosslink. We, in generally, what we want is, uh, I go back to this slide. We want a, uh, B or Y ions that are looking to the crosslink because, for, for example, this ion uh, uh, B9, the the mass of this is all of this, all of this part plus the crosslink. So we always want to obtain this kind of result where we have uh, masses looking towards the crosslink. Okay, now everything is in aerial. 
So, if you're going to uh, plan uh, a cross-linking experiment, in this couple of slides, I want to give you a couple of guidelines that are going to be useful for the planning of your, of your, of your experiment. For example, if you're going to use NHS-based NHS uh, cross-linkers, the ones that are more common, please keep in mind that they are very sensitive to humidity, so this cross-linker has to be prepared fresh every time and prepared fresh in uh, dimethyl sulfoxide. The best thing, like, like I told you earlier, is to combine several cross-linkers. I know they are expensive, but if you have the, the amount, the, the, the option, uh, do your experiment with different cross-linkers. If you're going to make a, an experiment of, experiment of in vivo cross-linking, cross for example, using B3, or that is a cross-linker that can penetrate in, inside the cell, Longer and flexible MS cleavage, cleavable excels are, are preferred. And also, please keep in mind that uh, for your organism, the cross-linker can penetrate into the cell. For the structural studies, we want to use shorter cross-linkers to give better resolution because we don't want our cross-linker to react with every part of the protein. So we want to keep them uh, in, in a constrained distance. And also you have to optimize your reaction, concentration, time, and quenching. After the reaction, if you are going to uh, do a cross-link reaction between a complex that you have isolated because they are recombinant proteins, maybe enrichment is not that important. But if you have a complex sample, please try to use an affinity tag like biotin or combine the enrichment with chromatography, for example, size exclusion or with electrophoresis. For LC-MSMS, keep in mind that cross-link peptides, peptides are more hydrophobic, so you will have to optimize your gradient, and also keep in mind that they are difficult to fragment. So another thing that we can say to the orbitrap is which, which energy we should uh, dissociate our peptide, and there is a, a protocol called step collisional energy in which the peptide is hit by three or four different energies at the same time, at different times. So you can have a lot of more information. For proteomic studies, generally we use 27 uh, kilo electron volts. That is uh, typical for the proteomic experiment, but, but for cross-linking you can use 27 plus minus five electron volts. And keep in mind that uh, plus two ions generally are not important. So you have to tell the technician of the uh, max spec to exclude two, uh, two plus ions from the analysis. Uh, this is, I'm going to keep this for later. And finally, Rodrik, se me toca. Toque el botón equivocado. So cross-linking mass spectrometry now is going quantitative and in vivo, and we can combine what uh, Pia told you early in the morning about SILAC with cross-linking mass spectrometry. In this way, we can have uh, information about the different levels of uh, protein, uh, proteomic changes and structural information all in the same experiment. For example, in this, uh, uh, the citation is not showing here, but in this experiment what they did is they used uh, a cross-linker that was permeable to the cells, and they used it in different conditions, and the cells also were uh, labeled with SILAC approach, like Pia told you in the uh, earlier. So for example, what they saw here is that this protein complex, which is incidentally is keratin, like uh, Eduardo told you before. This is uh, from two more cells that were resistant to chemotherapy, and they saw that the sensible cells, uh, that, or sea, non-resistant cells, have this type of keratin, and if you, uh, in the chemo-resistant cells, the protein complex of keratin changes not only their abundance, like in the common proteomics uh, experiment, but also their conformation because of the, the cross-link where joining different proteins. So in the same 
uh, experiment combining common proteomics with uh, cross-link, you can have those type uh, of information. They did that not only for keratin, but for a, a lot of other complexes in the cells. And uh, you can have so uh, upregulated proteins and conformational uh, information, for example, in this part, or these are downregulated proteins between the uh, different type of cells, but also they were changing the conformation of the protein complex. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for your attention, and uh, I hope you uh, uh, I give you some guidelines to uh, plan ahead your experiments using crosslinking. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, nice talk, uh, Germán. I, I wonder if, if we can combine the both strategies that we found this afternoon, the proximity proteomics and cross-linking. For example, you have uh, a bit with a tag that allow you to purify um, a complex. And instead of, uh, of make a biotinylation reaction, you can cross-link in vivo and you purify the a complex. Is it possible to do? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Uh, uh, for example, we are, you are uh, talking about combining turbo ID with cross-link or using a cross-link with a biotin handle? Not use the biodin, but use curling with the tag. Yes. Oh yes, yes. Yes, it, that one. Uh, that was one of the cross link I showed you uh, uh, earlier. Uh, but yes, you have cross linkers that have a biotin handle, and you can purify them. Yes, uh, that is completely possible. The other, the major disadvantage of those cross links, uh, those type of cross linker, is that they are quite big and they are difficult to maintain in solution or to penetrate the cell. So they are very difficult to handle in vivo, but in, in theory is quite possible, yes? Thanks a lot for this very nice presentation. Um, I, would, uh, I would have a question to the in vivo um, experiments which, which you mentioned. Uh, can you do that also in an unbiased manner, um, or uh, would that be would the database then be the, the data served, or can you do this on a proteome scale? Yes, you can do it uh, in an unbiased way. Uh, I don't think that that is the, the problem. This is the data analysis afterwards, but uh, this is the discovery phase of. Uh, I mean. Uh, you don't have to have previous knowledge about your system. I know if, if you have that is your question. Yeah, yeah but, but then how long does the database search take? It uh, okay. doesn't, doesn't take too long? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. One of the, the problems with cross-linking mass spectrometry, in, in my experience at least, is that when you put a, a, when you're using in vivo cross-linking, you have to put your whole database. So when you're going to use uh, recombinant proteins, uh, in, my, uh, in my experience, it only takes 10 minutes to uh, find the crosslink. For this kind of experiment, you need a super computer <laughs> with a lot of power and days of, of analysis. And you also need software specialized in in vivo crosslinking because uh, you are going to find in the literature a lot of different software. For example, SimExcel, that is the one that I use for recombinant proteins is not ready for uh, protein-wide cross-linking analysis. If you put like 20 proteins in your database, I did that, it crashes uh, 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 in a couple of hours. But MeroX is better for uh, in vivo. I, I think I have a slide, I know if, if we change the font in that. <laughs> Let me see. Yes, there. I highly recommend if you are going to use protein Y studies, MeroX is the best. It has a lot of options to reduce your database in some ways. 
and the algorithm is prepared for protein-wide analysis. That is the software that is best to use in those cases. Yes, yes. MetoX is free. Simexcel is free. Simexcel is from a computational group in Fiocruz in Brazil. Um, MetoX is from the group of Andrea Sins in, in I think it's Berlin. Uh, yes, we are going to use them this week. Yeah, they, they are freely available. Of course, uh, another uh, these are uh, very good because they are popular and they have a lot of years. Uh, in the literature, but Max Quan also right now is incorporating cross-linking mass spectrometry and Proton Discoverer. Proton Discoverer is the software that comes with the Orbitrap, but is uh, is expensive. Um, but it has a node where you can put cross-link uh, also uh, data. But yes, th those are free. Are free to use. Um, when you used to study interactomics. Do you start by this approach, or first you try without cross-linking, and if not, you don't have many results or many proteins that interact, then you go to cross-linking. When do you choose to use it? All right. I believe that cross-links, uh, cross-linking mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry is really useful when you are uh, combining the technique with another structural biology technique. For example, in, in our unit, we help a structural biology group that uh, was doing X-ray crystallography, and they had different uh, structures in the, in the crystals, and they didn't know if in solution, the, uh, the same structure in the crystal was the same as in solution. So in this case, you definitely should go to cross-linking mass spectrometry because it is going to tell you if the cross-link is uh, go according to your structure. So it depends on the question that you are going to try to answer. But a cross-link uh, mass spectrometry, I think, is very good for uh, a structural biology, more for interactomics right now, maybe. Uh, for a common interactomics, uh, Workflow, I in prefer to uh, start with uh, uh, affinity purification, maybe something like that, and then go to mass spectrometry. But if you're coming from a structural biology, you can uh, go to cross linking mass spectrometry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We are. We have a coffee break right now and then we return here later for the last talk of the day.